Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. On a Sunday evening, it certainly is. Good evening, everybody. I'm Art Bell, and it's good to be back uh, from the holidays, Dreamland-wise. Back into live programs once again. Let me tell you what's ahead on this evening. Linda Howe, of course, with her update from Philadelphia. Linda Howe, our award-winning investigative journalist looking into crop circles, animal mutilations. Not a project begun for that purpose, but one that uh, sort of became that as she was uh, drawn to it with the material she found. Very interesting. And now I like it, and she hates it when I say she's the world's expert on these things, but I think she is. In the sense, she knows more about them than anybody else. I li- uh, then um, a Native American, a Hopi uh, Native American, named Robert Morning Sky. And uh, this is a particularly uh, interesting opportunity to interview uh, Robert Morning Sky because he is going to be retiring. He's got probably about another 30 days, I'd say, on the lecture circuit. And then it's over. The public side of Robert Morning Sky is over. So I feel honored to get the interview this evening. I would like to welcome a brand new affiliate, number 161, and that would be KKBJAM in Bemidji, that's Bemidji, I hope, Minnesota. Uh, Welcome to the program, 1360 on the AM dial. Uh, All the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I hope, Linda Howe, Linda... Yes, Art, I'm here, ah, and yeah. I wish you a happy new year. Thank you. Uh, the storm has really been something, but... Uh, well, what is it like uh, where you are? I, I guess it's a little heavier further north, but Philadelphia, that might be right in the... Th- what's going on? Well, it's very odd, the wind patterns. Uh, down at the airport, 26 inches at the airport. It's a record. Oh my and God. a friend of mine uh, over near Atlantic City just called and said that he's looking at about 20 inches on his deck, and that's right near <laughs> the ocean. I've got drifts that are up four to five feet on my deck, but the snow has stopped where I am, so it's uh, very uh, patchy, and then and as you go up north, I guess New York and further, they're just really getting it badly. Well, so much for opening the government tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. And it is January, and it is supposed to be cold and snowy here. So, Well, in the past three weeks, uh, more unusual animal deaths uh, have been reported in several places, including Montana, Oregon, and the continuing mystery of the Puerto Rico creature known as the Chupacabras goat sucker. Two days ago, there was another attack on goats near San Juan, and on Thursday, December 21st, near Guanaca on the southwestern coast, a mechanic named Osvaldo Claudio Rosado was up for some reason at 3 o'clock in the morning washing his car. He walked toward the patio of his home to shut off the water faucet where the hose was connected, Mm -hmm. and suddenly, without any warning, he was grabbed from behind. When Rosado tried to fight off the intruder, he was shocked to see a black-haired animal about five feet tall that looked like a monkey or a gorilla. (laughs) The animal ran away, and Rosado drove to the Tita Matai Hospital in Yauco to have doctors examine and treat cuts on his stomach. One of the attending doctors said that the cuts looked like they had been made with sharp fingernails. So now there's confusion among authorities about this primate. Is there a wild monkey on the loose on Puerto Rico for some reason that's attacking domestic animals, puncturing their necks, and sucking blood? Or are there also other weird creatures, the ones described as having the large, glowing red eyes in the chicken feet? Or could the chupacabras be a variation on the infamous Bigfoot creature long associated in the United States with animal mutilation cases? Linda, do you know offhand whether there are any animals uh, that we are aware of in the mainstream scientific community that, in effect, are vampires, uh, other than bats, perhaps? Right off, I can't say with certainty. 
uh, an answer to that question, but it's a good one, Art, and I will do some uh, further research and see because this Puerto Rico story continues, and I will be doing more interviews, as a matter of fact, this week, and it's becoming very germane to find out if, uh, in fact, if there are any uh, primates who have ever done anything like that. So I will do some more research. Very good. And in another recent Puerto Rico attack, six sheep were found dead, and the owner said that rigor mortis never set in. According to him, the animals never stiffened up after death, which is unusual, but has been noted in some of the classic animal mutilations that I've researched in other parts of the world. Hmm. And similarly, another dead animal that did not seem to stiffen at all was a pregnant heifer discovered at the Tim Howard Ranch near Klamath Falls, Oregon, on December 21st. Mr. Howard has been ranching there for about 15 years, and he has never seen a mutilated animal before. This is Mr. Howard. She's laying on her right side. Her tongue was cut off right at the gum line. Uh, her right, left eye was missing. Her left ear was gone. It was kind of cut around in a little bit of an oval shape and just took out, like, all to the bone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we noticed that the tips were cut off, and the back, just below the tail, was cut out in an oval shape, getting rid of the rectum and the female parts and, and uh, stuff like that. Was there any fluid oozing from any of these cuts? No, none. And there wasn't really. There was a little pool of blood inside the back of the cow, but not, not enough to really... I mean, it could have just been from a slice or something, you know, but it, there was no, hardly any blood at all. All right. Um, and was that animal, did it have any temperature left in its skin or hide? It, it was still fairly warm, and uh, we were kind of trying to determine when it died, you know, so we checked around there, and the uh, rigor mortis or nothing hadn't set in. The, the animal was still a little warm, and the joints all moved and everything. The cow was bloated up, though. Mm -hmm. Now, as a uh, rancher who has uh, been around and raised cattle for uh, a dozen or more years, what was your first reaction to the cuts themselves? Well, they weren't. It wasn't ripped and torn. It was a fine cut, and it was. You know, usually when an animal gets a hold of it, they tear the hell out of things, and it was. It was nice, smooth cuts. Uh, and no blood. There's usually blood everywhere when a predator gets done. Right. Now, what was the ground like around the animal? Was it moist or dry or? A little moist. Uh, we drove in there. It's it's fairly cold here right now. I think yesterday, it, like the top was like 42 or something. And uh, but there was still a little frost on the ground when we went in. Matter of fact, it was starting to cool off for the evening. And uh, you could see our tire tracks when you went in, but you couldn't see nothing else around there. No other type of track. Uh, what about even the cow zone track? Was there anything visible around it? There was no no track of any sort there. Uh, what did the Oregon State Police say? Well, the first guy said he'd never seen anything like it. He, uh, you know, it was definitely something different than a than he'd ever seen. And then I'll tell you something else that was odd, and maybe it's, I don't know, once something like this happens, you start thinking maybe more than you should. But the cow was laying on her tail, and that's, that just doesn't happen. The cow was lying on its tail? Yeah. The tail was curled up underneath it, and it was lying on it. And that's, you know, you just, uh, I, the, a tail's kind of a balancing device for them things. And I don't know. It just seemed odd that it was. I've seen a lot of dead cows. I've never seen them laying on their tail. Almost as if the cow was set down in the air onto the ground at the rear and on the tail, and then the rest of the body uh, laid down. I could go for something like that. I could believe that. And I, another thing is there's no sign of any struggle around the cow. I mean, you know, cows don't die easy even if they're sick. They froth and kick around and but there's no sign of nothing with this one. It's just laying there with its head downhill, and that's not very, you know, to me, that's not very likely either. Right. Now, what about where the teats were removed from the udder bag? <laughs> they were just, uh, looks like they were pinched off or cut off or something like that, and all four of them had a, kind of a little black ring around them. 
um, again, are more specific, exposed to some kind of heat. Yeah, I would say so. And uh, it's like with the tongue yesterday, it was kind of, it was at the base of the teeth where it had been cut off, just like if you'd followed its mouth around and cut it off. Huh. And it was dark colored. Um, do you find that the fact that the coyotes have not attacked this carcass is unusual? Yeah, I'd say there's something wrong with the carcass if the coyotes won't eat it. I asked Mr. Howard if he and his family had noticed any unusual lights or helicopter activity over his ranch, and he said that they weren't aware of any but would start looking more at the sky. And two days after that uh, interview, he called again amazed at what he and his wife did see shortly after we first talked. Last night we got ready to go to bed. It was probably... I don't know, quarter to 11 or so. And she, the dog was barking outside or something there. She looked outside, and for some reason, she looked up north here, and, and there was two or three just kind of flashing red lights. Or I wouldn't say they were red, but they were kind of an amber color. And then one of them was blank, and then the other one was blank. Well, we watched there a while and, and couldn't figure out what the hell would even be up there. Cause it was, you know, it was quite a ways out. And then a little bit off to the left, there was... There was another one that was just a clear kind of a flashing light. You know, it's pretty in his open sky. I mean, it couldn't get no more open than that. And then way off to the right, there was another kind of a... It, it was kind of a clear-looking light that was kind of blinking. So there were at least four. Yeah, at least maybe five. And this is a part of the sky that at this time of year, uh, you know it, you know it, and you, have you ever seen lights like this there? I've never seen lights up in there any time. And how long did you watch them blink? Probably ten minutes. Then what happened? They just stayed blinking there. We just watched and watched and watched. And it all stayed the same. It did look like the, it was. there was either another one in that pack that was two was in, or one of them was moving up and down, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but, I mean, it was probably, it had to be probably 40, 50 miles away, probably. So you went to bed while they were still out there blinking? Yeah. Um, and is this in anywhere the general direction of where you had the heifer mutilated? No, it was no, uh uh. It, well, you, they were in a distance. The lights were in quite a distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, And the heifer was how far from your house? Oh, probably a mile here. Okay. Um, but where the lights were, uh, as far as you're concerned, was so much further that... Oh, yeah. But what would be over there, 40 or 50 miles? Cattle and farmland, and yeah, that's all this country is out here. Now, I've been working with an Oregon investigator, Roy Myers, who was able to get tissue and pasture grass samples from the Howard mutilation, and uh, Dr. Levengood in Michigan and Dr. Altschuler are uh, about ready to start work on those, so in a couple of weeks I should have a report on Dreamland about what they've found. All right, the interesting thing is no rigor mortis. All right. That's right. If there's no rigor mortis, that means there has to be a basic chemical, hopefully detectable change uh, that has occurred in the samples. Right, and we, it has come up occasionally in the past, but getting uh, tissue, which this time around we've got, it will be very interesting to see if we can confirm the high heat at the excision lines and if Dr. Levengood can find these same metabolism changes in some of the plants. Uh, this was definitely fresh, but it was so cold, and when the grass is starting to lose its metabolic rate anyway because of winter, we're not sure if we're going to be able to learn something from the grass, but we're sure going to try. And we need to get to these animals when they are as fresh as possible. And so I welcome reports from our Dreamland listeners. And uh, if they want to get a report to you or get your books or yes. any of your materials, you're now going to tell us how to do that. Yes, and I just also wanted one other note that I'm interested in finding out if anybody has been seeing any unusual triangle-shaped objects in the sky or rectangle shapes. We've had about a half a dozen here in the Pennsylvania and New Jersey area just in the last four weeks. Uh, what eyewitnesses are describing is very similar to the thousands of reports in Belgium about five years ago, and I wonder if whatever this is is showing up anywhere else in the United States. So um, the way the, to contact me are by mail, Linda Howe at Post Office Box 538, in Huntingdon Valley, 
Pennsylvania, spelled H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D as in dog, O-N, Valley, P-A, zip code 19006. My fax number is area code 215-491-9842. My email is lmh 3 at AOL dot com and for information about my books and documentaries or to leave a brief message please call my toll free 800 number and that is 800-707-9993 again that's 800-707-9993 And, Art, I would say 1996 is getting off to a hectic start. Oh, it's going to be an interesting year. I feel it, too. Uh, Very exciting. Um, Yes, you can feel it. Linda, we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, next week if, uh, that is, your phone lines are up (laughs) and your home is not buried. (laughs) Yeah, the the blizzard of uh, 96 begins. But uh, there are... I'm, one way or the other, I would get into report because there is so much coming from so many directions, and I have a lot of different interesting stories lined up for the next few weeks. Well, no offense, but it's about 60 degrees here. Better thee than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we have gorgeous springs and summers. Yes, you do, and you and can look fall. forward to that. You think about that all tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> uh, thank you, Linda. Good night. Thank you. That's <laughs> Linda Howell. Back in the middle of the uh, horrendous storm, and it is a bad one now smashing the northeast dreamland we'll be right back with native american robert morning sky should be an interesting evening stay right there Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll free 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 8255. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at 702 727 1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is coming up in a moment, Native American. Uh, Native American. Uh, Robert Morning Sky from the Hopi Indian Nation, and we will talk of many things. So have a seat at the campfire. <laughs> How's that? One of the best and shortest ways, I think, to introduce uh, Robert Morning Sky would be to read you what Duncan Rhodes said about him. He said, One of the most remarkable people I have ever met is Robert Morning Sky. He has two sides. On one, he is an accomplished American Indian dancer, an artist, and on the other, he contains the ancient knowledge of generations of Hopi Indian elders. He originally came to Australia to attend one of the festivals held every summer. While there, he came across some of the more radical UFO information circulating about the country these days. I say radical in the sense that Bill Cooper, John Lear, etc., are considered radical by orthodox UFO researchers. So, he found himself being asked um, about matters relating to aliens, UFOs, etc., during his talk circles in that area, bombarded with questions. The thing I found most incredible about speaking with this full-blooded Indian medicine man is that he spoke in the presence of aliens... Uh, in the USA as if they had been here all along. What's more is that he's never read a UFO magazine, never been to a UFO conference, never heard of the main UFO lecturers, and yet he's saying the same things as many of them. What I can say is he impressed me greatly. That's Duncan Rhodes. This is the end of 
let us go um, to Robert Morning Sky. Robert, where are you located? I'm in Phoenix this evening, sir. Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, sir. I guess you're on a lecture circuit, so you're you're flying around, huh? Um, yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, it's been uh, quite a hectic year. I'm on the uh, the last leg, as you mentioned earlier, and I uh, look forward to uh, retiring. And so that will be the end of generally the public life of Robert Morning Sky. Um, yes, I, I say that with a measure of sadness. I'm sure. I'm very proud of. Uh, what we have done in the uh, short year. Um, I will uh, honor a few engagements that take us beyond February the 1st uh, in the United States and then in Germany. But um, the, the pace has been horrendous. We did uh, 45 lectures and workshops in 48 weeks. I have three more to go in the last four weeks. And um, uh, the response, and I'm very, very uh, pleased and very uh, honored to have had the kind of response that we've had from the general public. Um, Duncan Rhodes in Australia, he's the uh, publisher of Nexus Magazine, was extraordinarily kind to us when we were there a couple of years ago. Uh, I would like to uh, count him as a friend. It was through his encouragement that we actually um, decided to speak out in the United States. And so... Um, come February the 1st of 96, uh, with great pride and, again, a measure of sadness, um, I, I will retire. It is, it is time. I have done uh, everything that I could to fulfill a promise to my grandfather, and uh, the time has come to rest. All right. Um, then let me ask you this. Why are there not more in your shadow? Why are there not more Hopi uh, Indians? Why are there not other Indian nations that speak out publicly the way you do, or that have people that speak out publicly. I'm sure there are some, but frankly, I haven't heard of them. And uh, so, what's going on? Well, uh, there, there are absolutely good reasons. Now, let me let me give, begin by correcting a, a very common misconception, and I want to make sure that people understand that uh, Duncan Rhodes has made an error in his quote, and several other people have in their comments about me. Uh, I am Native American. I am Hopi and Apache, full-blooded. I am not, however, a medicine man, a shaman. I am not an elder, never have claimed to uh, be anything of, of, of that sort. And I want to stress that I speak only for myself. I, I do not speak for any nation. For the whole nation. No, I understand That's that. I, I'm simply asking you why there aren't more Robert Morning Skies okay. out there. Okay. Um, perhaps the simplest explanation is to say that um, in the history of the relationship between the civilized world, in quotation marks, and the Native American, uh, history has not been kind to Native Americans. Our uh, and and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but as Native Americans, our upbringing revolves around star beings. It revolves around descent from the stars. Um, I, I would go so far as to say that uh, the Māori in New Zealand, the uh, Aborigines in Australia have similar uh, stories. Mm -hmm. And our cosmogony, our belief system, our way of life revolves daily around the existence of star beings and, and those who have assisted us and, and uh, been with us all this time. The problem is that um, for some reason, and I don't know why, the civilized world, uh, researchers, writers, uh, people who I believe have uh, good intention, when they hear or heard the stories 50 years ago, 100 years ago about star beings and, and uh, that kind of phenomena, um, it was attributed to the smoking of some uh, grass. It was attributed to the myth and legends of, uh, of a primitive people, the arrogance of a, uh, of a civilized world that puts down um, what has been labeled a primitive world, uh, has become a bad habit. One of the things that I found on the uh, on this tour in the last 11 months is that while um, I'm not sure how to describe them other than the the higher ups, uh, some of the researchers, some of the uh, scientists, some of the uh, establishment types. I hate to use that 60s word. Um, 
are reticent to acknowledge the existence of star beings. Obviously, we've been suffering with the Roswell phenomena for 50 years now, and we're only now beginning to, to get evidence and uh, are rewarded with another effort by the military and the government to, to say, no, that in fact it's not a new fantastic balloon, but it's uh, some sort of a new, um, at that time, highly uh, specialized uh, disc. So Native Americans have not had a good time and I would I count other primitive peoples in this, this comment, we've not had a good time in trying to tell our stories and our legends. One of the things that I have tried to say so many, many times is that um, most of the reported crashes of disks that have occurred, uh, particularly in the late 40s and early 50s, most of them occurred on or near Indian reservation land. Mm -hmm. And we have always found it amazing that very well-meaning researchers, uh, writers who go out and uh, scour the countryside, somehow they have missed the point that Native Americans would rather live out under the night sky than, you know, under a roof. That is part and parcel of our existence. We have for hundreds, for thousands of years, uh, lived in the outdoors. As a child, I remember... Uh, being taken out by my grandfather to go sit on a hillside to watch the lights dance in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, it is astounding that somehow the UFO research community, I mean the very, very, uh, the, the truth seekers, somehow that point has escaped them. Well, all right, let me stop you there and say, mm -hmm. when I asked the question, here is the spirit in which I asked it, mm -hmm. um, Americans are now rapidly re reaching 50 years of age, about 10,000 a day, you know, the baby boomer generation. Yes, sir. The baby boomer generation is becoming far more spiritual uh, by the day as, as they get older. older. And uh, um, it's not uh, a particularly structured uh, spiritualism, but very non-structured, very much uh, like the Native American uh, uh, traditions. We also are becoming much more conscious of the earth around us, much as Native Americans have always been. So, to me, it would make sense that the baby boomers would reach out to people like you. And if you're not going to be there anymore, then there ought to be others. Well, you know, you're, you're absolutely correct in, in, in what you're saying, because uh, in the last 11 months, what we did discover is that uh, excuse the description, the average man, the average woman, those of, of us, and I include myself in that, who are not part of the in-the-know community or the, uh, the power loop, that in fact we all really do have common uh, uh, desires, goals, and we are reaching for spirituality. The problem is that so many other Native Americans that I am familiar with who have extended a hand end up getting exploited end up getting used. Uh, their teachings are turned around for the wrong reasons. I mean, one of the phenomena for, for Native Americans that, that I think uh, best portrays this is uh, the, the gambling casinos that are uh, uh, cropping up on reservations. Uh, I speak, again, only for myself, and I'm sure I will get in trouble for it, but I believe that's probably one of the worst things that that, that has happened to Native Americans. That Might I ask why? Uh, in other words... Um, in the coverage that I've seen, and it mel may well be, you know, just orchestrated coverage, uh -huh. uh, they say that gambling has brought to reservations uh, money, housing, uh, an economy that simply did not exist previous to the gambling, uh, very positively portrayed. Now, it may be by those who want gambling there. I don't know. Uh, but you've got the opposite reaction. Why? Yes, because uh, though I, I agree that uh, for the most part it probably has put money into the economy of the reservation, but as I understand from other elders and from those that I have spoken to, the average uh, reservation take so to speak, is about 10% of the money generated. The bulk of the funds seems to be going towards the management companies, which are, are almost always not a reservation uh, group or a company. It's something that is off-reservation. No, I understand. The casinos come in and they build. Yes, um, right. And so I, I have, again, my, my personal opinion, I have a problem. I believe that, um, boy... Though the casinos are bringing in some money, I wish 
that there was another way to do that. It is an, it is an example, I would suggest, of Native Americans um, who, I don't know if it was uh, belonged, the idea belonged to one of us, I don't know if it came off the reservation, but it's, a, it's an example of exploitation. It is good, but I think it could have been a lot better had Native Americans stuck to their guns and done it themselves. Well, of course, that requires a lot of capital. And uh, it's, well, it's something they didn't have, so I guess... That's the sadness. That is, uh, again, uh, without uh, dwelling on it very for a, a long time, that is one of the reasons that, that the uh, circuit uh, tour that I'm doing will be ending. It's, it's costly. It's very difficult to maintain the pace and to uh, continue. And uh, funding is just, uh, I'm sure everybody that's listening understands that funding is very difficult, and so we do the best with what we can. I just... Uh, I wish that the response of the civilized world, the powers that be, would be just a little bit kinder to Native peoples. Uh, do you think it will change the nature of reservations in a negative way? You know, aside from the positive aspect of more money floating around. Um, will it subvert the culture? Oh, I think so. I think so, because um, unfortunately, though, uh, money is and I hesitate to say a necessity, but it is something that is uh, crucial to survival in the system that exists, it also begins to uh, uh, pervert the values. Why should a young Native American man or Native American woman on the reservation, why should they pursue becoming a singer, a dancer, an artist, and somebody who continues the tradition of weaving baskets or doing sand paintings when they can go to a local casino and become a cocktail waitress or a blackjack dealer and make infinitely more money? And I can understand understand the, the survival of it, it's just, uh, unfortunately, my belief, again, only that it will pervert the traditional values. Uh, could it be so serious that, uh, you suppose, Robert, eventually the Indian nations, uh, as we know them in the reservations, as we know them, will simply disappear, simply disappear into America's new culture? Well, the tragedy is that it's already occurring. There are many, many tribes on the eastern seaboard who are not familiar with their traditions, who don't know the old ways, who have lost uh, their songs and dances. Uh, they were uh, incorporated into the American concept uh, 200 years ago. Here in the Southwest, uh, they are relatively intact because we have not had that much contact. Arizona became a state um, only some 80 years ago in 1912. So... Our values here are relatively intact, but in the East Coast, there are tribes who have been swallowed up and who really don't have a sense of their Indianness. I was just recently asked to go to Seattle to uh, speak to some children on a reservation up there, and in the Northwest, the same thing is occurring. The, the values of being a warrior, the values of standing for something regardless of the odds against you, um, they're being lost to a regular paycheck, a fast car, and sure. a CD player. No, I'm sure it's true. Um, what is the what is the blue kachina? Well, the the blue star kachina is is one of the most fascinating of all the kachinas in in the uh, Hopi way of life. A kachina has three forms. It is the spirit of the things that are around us. It is the spirit of uh, the wind, the trees, the plants, the animals. Uh, the kachina is also the dancer, a, a, a human being who dances, uh, personifies, dresses, and becomes the spirit. And then you have the third variation, which is the actual carving, a uh, carving that represents in three-dimensional form the figure. The Blue Star Kachina is perhaps one of the, the, the most mysterious. It, uh, there is not a great deal of information on the Blue Star Kachina. Its name is Nangasohu. Uh, it's sometimes called the Chasing Star or the Meteor Kachina, but one of the most dramatic aspects of the, the uh, carving of the figure is that it has a four-pointed black star on its face. Um, the rest of the face is blue. Hmm. There is a long trailing headdress of feathers that go, pardon me, that go down its back and trail down onto the floor. And it is said that this represents the long tail of the meteor of the blue star. A couple of amateur astronomers, uh, one named Hale and one named Bop, and one, as a matter of fact, from Arizona, have discovered this thing out beyond the orbit of Jupiter called now Hale Bop. 
It's coming this way. We'll miss Earth, they say, by 1 to 1.5 AU or astronomical units. Uh, is it possible, everybody wants to know, uh, Mr. Morningstar, whether that might be Blue Kachina? Well, I'm going to uh, stick my neck out and suggest that should the, the data that I have seen uh, be accurate, that in fact uh, it, it very likely is, and that, uh, again, let us uh, upset the apple cart on the reservation a little more and suggest that I, that I believe the, that there are several Hopi processes that are being fulfilled by the appearance of this comet and that in the papers that I have recently released and will elaborate on in the last three appearances, the Blue Star Kachina Nangasuhu is very likely uh, the comet hale bopp what is most curious, and, and, and sir, if you would allow me, you are so kind, Art, to allow me to uh, have this uh, last uh, interview, a gift from me to you because I was going to save this for California. But there is a Hopi prophecy tucked away. It can be found. It is in several books that are out there. And the prophecy says that the blue star Kachina, Nangasuhu, does, n- does not appear individually it always appears in pairs there is another prophecy that says that in the time of the end of the world cycle this last cycle there is a grand white brother that will appear his name is Bahana or Pahana depending on the accent of the individual Pahana, the great white brother, will appear at the end of the cycle. I wonder how Zachariah Sitchin would pronounce it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, Robert, we're uh, at the top of the hour, so you can take a rest and think Thank about you, that sir. one. And we'll be right back to you. Robert Morning Sky um, is my guest, and he is a Native American of the Hopi Indian Nation. He speaks, though, for himself and very well indeed. There is much more to come on Dreamland. I'm Art Bell. We'll be right back. Continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 702- 
727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. My guest is Robert Morning Sky, Native American, Hopi and uh, Apache, I believe, and I'll confirm that in a moment, and uh, we're talking of many things, as I said we would. We were talking of the Blue Kachina Star. You said, yes, indeed, it might be hale Bop, and you said it portends the arrival of another. Yes, sir. And when the other arrives, I, I think I was at the point of asking you how Zachariah Sitchin might pronounce it. Is it is it the rogue planet that Zachariah Sitchin ima- imagines uh, is going to come back? I believe so. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin is, I uh, would consider, one of the most unrecognized scholars. His work is absolutely fantastic. I wish I'd have had it when I was in college years ago. But um, the name which he assigns to the 12th planet, to the uh, uh, black rogue, um, is Nibiru. What is most interesting about Nibiru, a Sumerian term, is that I suggest it's directly related to an ancient Egyptian word for the sun disk, or the Aten, which in fact was called Neb Heru. Neb Heru literally meant Lord of the Sun. Mm -hmm. And then if we refer to one more ancient society in uh, ancient Babylon, the guardian and protector of the skies of a city called Lugash was named Ningirsu. And I am, again, going to suggest that Nibiru, Neberu, Ningirsu, and the Hopi Nangasohu, the Blue Star Kachina, are all one and the same. And that, again, should the data of the hale comet be accurate, and at this point I'm relying on the experts, it has every appearance of being uh, the visitor that we will see in early 97. Hopi prophecy, however, if all of this is accurate, Hopi prophecy suggests that approximately seven years later, we will be visited by its second older big brother. The uh, the curious phenomena of hale Bop, if the Hopi prophecies apply, I am going to suggest that there will be a blue face, a blue corona, a blue aura. There will be some blue factor to the appearance of hale Bop. Hmm. And Big Brother, which will appear in about seven years after uh, uh, 97, will probably have a white face. It will have a white aura or a white corona. And when it gets here... Uh, as in the MASH song about suicide bringing on many changes? <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's a time for suicide. On the other hand, I'm sure some people might No, 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 no. I wasn't arguing for suicide. <laughs> uh, it will bring with it many changes. Absolutely. And, and we are, I believe, already beginning to uh, <laughs> witness these changes. Uh, I bow to the words of a gentleman who I have a tremendous amount of respect for who calls it the quickening. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I believe that uh, many, many things are going to be happening, not just the earth changes that everyone uh, is, is talking about and making predictions about, but also changes in, in mankind itself. Uh, there will be a speeding up of, of events and biological processes. One of the things I've suggested uh, this last year on the tour is that women will find that their monthly cycles will shorten. Uh, they're going to find that uh, the the uh, uh, what the pregnancy stages are going to quicken. Uh, I am going to also suggest that we're going to find some anomalous changes uh, in the uh, the actual birth of children. We have already, for example, on the reservation, begun to witness the birth of children with six fingers with six toes. These are not a, a just a useless appendage, but a fully functioning, uh, unrecognizable uh, now, sixth finger. You, and, uh, you're, giving me, you're giving me a lot of news here. I've not heard a word about this. Where has this begun to occur? These have been reported on the Navajo Reservation, which is in the Four Corners area here in the southwest. My understanding is that there are some reports like this in Alaska. I will be, uh, I will be happy to contact the individual and have them and forward this to you, but um, uh, I don't have them right here on hand, but I, I will have them faxed to you. But there are reports of uh, six-fingered children. I have uh, photographs 
of uh, some children, one that was uh, born in the United States, not to a Native American family, but uh, the granddaughter of a very, very close friend. And I promise you it is unrecognizable, uh, you know, as a sixth finger. You, you simply would have to be looking carefully in order to see it. All right. Well, then we have to talk quickly about Roswell or Socorro, whichever it was, mm -hmm. uh, and the Santilli footage with the six d digits, fingers, and uh, and on the feet. That's correct, sir. And, uh, and again, there is, believe it or not, I suggest a link between the hale Comet, its return, the surfacing of the uh, film of the six-fingered uh, figure in the Santilli tape. I just today received a fax from Mr. Hesseman and uh, Mr. Santilli, and um, I, there is most definitely a link between the birth of children with six fingers and six toes with the surfacing of the Santilli tape, which shows the uh, six-fingered six uh, wow. hands and the six-toed. And I will also, again, refer back to the ancient societies back in Egypt and Samaria, where the numbering system was based on 12 and not 10. Um, I can only suggest that's a very curious coincidence that uh, a 12-numbered system was used by the ancients. We have a 12-fingered being who was uh, autopsied in that film that Mr. Santilli provided us. And, again, with the birth of uh, six-fingered or 12-fingered, 12 12-toed uh, children, um, and this is going to, I again suggest, is going to happen. Actually, it was, not, it was not one, but it was two films, I believe, of two separate autopsies. That's correct. Both with um, six fingers, six toes, and you, you say ancient. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the um, uh, very secular phrase, hide in, hiding in plain sight. Are, are you trying to tell us that these people, the star people, if you will, are with us now. Yes, sir, I am. One of the um, one of the most important aspects of what I have been trying to suggest all year on the tour and will finish with is I, I am trying to provide documentation, ancient sources, contemporary sources, and suggest to the world that the gods and devils of mankind have uh, those that we spoke of in, in ancient uh, uh, legends and uh, all the ancient civilizations spoke of um, that not only did they exist, and certainly Zacharias Sitchin, and uh, there is a new book out, Fingerprints of the Gods. My apologies to the author. I do not recall his name. I was just gifted with a copy. There are numerous authors who are writing about the ancient ones in the sky, star beings who have uh, either interfered with or guided man, uh, let the listener choose the word. And should, for example, all of these authors, should the stories and the research and the material that they're providing be true, then the question that has to be asked is, where are they? And I simply suggest to everyone that not only are the stories true and they were here, but they are still here now. And if they are hiding. They are hiding in plain sight. Um, they are not little green men. They are not uh, these the enormous headed, big eyed uh, creatures with green, scaly skin. Um, if the ancient stories are true, if Zachary Sitchin and his material is, is accurate, and what I am trying to portray is accurate, we are the descendants of these star beings. And so all I can say is we don't see them because they look like us. <laughs> yeah, that's hiding in plain sight, all right. Absolutely. Uh, what bothers me or affects me or makes me think more than anything else that there is something to all this is not just my own uh, observation as a talk show host of what I'm calling the quickening, but I've interviewed Sitchin, I've interviewed Gordon Michael, I've interviewed actually just about uh, all of the big prophets and um, uh, soothsayers of our time, and... It's not any individual one of them that affects me, but it is collectively their message, which, along with your message and all the rest of the others, almost all say the same thing. They may come at it from different uh, perspectives, uh, one with visions, one with this or that, you with uh, your ancient knowledge, or, or, or knowledge that is a ancient, I suppose I should say, all of it collectively points toward the same uh, next few years. Uh, so I guess I would ask you, is it possible, do you think we're all experiencing collective millennium madness, or is it really coming? 
Uh, no, I, I think that it's absolutely uh, going to make its appearance in the next uh, few years. The changes, uh, I mean, certainly if we look at the earthquake phenomena, the numbers of the quakes, the intensities has increased. Uh, it's just it's geometric in its, in its number. I know. And um, perhaps, again, the best analogy that I can use is that of a roller coaster. Uh, we are all participating in a roller coaster, whether one deems it the Earth or the universe. But we have crested the hill. We are. Uh, we have reached the last quarter, and it's all a downhill rush to the very end. Uh, as this occurs, as we come speeding down off that last hillside, um, there are many people who are going to uh, be frightened by the quickening. They're going to be frightened by the speeding up of, of the event. Some of them are going to want to bail out. On the other hand, there are some who will enjoy the ride. Uh, there are those who will toss their arms up in oh, the air right. and let out a, a great big yell, and we're going to enjoy as uh, this particular ride comes to an end. Which, now, which group are you in? <laughs> I'm going to throw my arms up, I'm going to pow out, and I'm going to dance. I am not predicting the end of the world. Uh, I, I am not a doom uh, sayer. I believe that the world as we know it will change. Yes, there are going to be some very interesting things that are going to occur. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic is that the light switch is going to get turned off and no one's going to be able to turn it back on. The question is, can an individual survive uh, without electricity? Uh, and that's a very, very uh, real question that we have to answer. The world will change. In a way, it's interesting because in a lot of parts of the world they do it every day on a regular basis with no problem. Here in America, when the electricity goes off, just about everything we use to function in life stops. Exactly. Um, I've got a fax here, Robert. Um, see, I'm sure you'll agree with this, or maybe you won't. Um, Art, on why there aren't more Native Americans speaking out as your guest, Robert Morningsky. It's because most are perceived in an ill light. Look how most are portrayed as alcoholics who need the government to survive, or in movies as some kind of superstitious simpleton. My wife is Navajo. While she doesn't know a great deal about her heritage, her dad does. He regales us with tales of the lore of the Navajo and the strange occurrences in the San Luis Valley in Colorado. They are their art. It's just that they tell those who will listen. That's from John and Morgan Hill. Oh, I absolutely agree. That, that's, that's absolutely correct. It's, it's interesting to um, be on the circuit and to hear... Uh, individuals who uh, claim to be searching for the truth or uh, looking for data, and yet when we begin to tell the uh, the stories, um, it, I, I'm not sure why the reaction is as this gentleman has said, but he's absolutely correct. They just simply do not listen. The wonder, however, of, of this last year for me has been that I have found that people at this time, and I'm not sure why, but they are listening. It, it's it's. Um, I think we are bonded uh, from long, long ago. There is a difficulty uh, when I speak with other elders because they, they are concerned that when I speak of these things that perhaps uh, those who are not Indian will not understand. But I have a problem with that. I, I believe a warrior is someone who has a type of heart. Uh, an Indian, a Native American, is someone who has the type of blood. And so I really do believe in the warriorhood of mankind. I really do believe that we can handle the quickening, the changes that are coming. And I really believe that if the higher-ups, if the powers that be would leave us alone, I don't believe we'd have half the problems that we have on uh, this world today. Many of the prophets that one might speak to would suggest that these coming changes that we all seem to know are coming, uh, can either be lessened or modified or negated altogether by human behavior. Is that your belief? I think so. I, I think that, again, at any given moment, we have uh, the opportunity to make a change, uh, both as an individual and as a whole. The problem that I have is believing that um, we will be able to um, get together with a common direction. Unfortunately, we have too many, again, powers that be from institutions that are uh, oriented towards religion or education or economic uh, sources, bankers, uh, politicians. Um, the institutions are the ones that are really... Um, Possibly uh, past the point of no return, in other yeah, words. Robert, yeah, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll be right back to you. Robert, Morning Sky. More in a moment.
Once again, Robert Morningsky, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. How about a few phone calls? Yes, sir. All right. Um, just before I pick up the first line, um, I've got a, a fax here from somebody who simply asks, um, one of the most important elements of your work, Mr. Sky's work, Morning Sky, is your translation uh, or translations of Orion and Cirrus words. Please ask him about these words, the ones covered in your papers. Are we talking about the, uh, the decipherment of the, uh, the Santilli tape? I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't have a good... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at the, uh, the abilities of your listeners. Um, I have, in the, uh, just the last few weeks, received from Michael Hesseman in Mesquite, Nevada, at a conference there, yes. a, uh, a copy of uh, the film that Ray Santilli released on the, uh, the autopsy of the, uh, of the alien being. Um, I was caught by the uh, hieroglyphs, the uh, figures that appeared on the beam in the uh, wreckage and debris segment. The I-beams. The I-beams, that's correct. Um, as a Native American, and in, in my research, I have always been fascinated with uh, petroglyphs and the stories that they tell. Sure. And when I actually saw the, the first videotape, I was absolutely caught up in what they might represent. They had a vague familiarity with it, but the video copy that I had originally received from a uh, friend from the Fox Network uh, production was not very clear. Michael Hesseman's tape, however, and I have to thank him greatly for it, was much clearer, and when I saw the, uh, the uh, film, I uh, used a VCR to uh, create some stills. Right. And I immediately went to some alphabet charts that I have been constructing over the last 30 years since I uh, began the linguistics breakdown of languages in college in, in the late 60s. And I, I know that this sounds uh, relatively outrageous, but by very carefully analyzing the possible path of the uh, the characters, I was actually able to come up with a translation. I submitted uh, copies oh, wow. to a few key people, and certainly you, my friend, were one of them. And I am offering what is a suggested translation of what is on the I beam. I received a uh, fax today from uh, Mr. Hessman and Mr. Santilli. Uh, very pleased with the results. They're sending me some additional uh, footage and stills, which I have not seen. And, um, All right, well, I can't stand it. Can you tell us? <laughs> um, I, I believe you're holding a copy of, of the uh, uh, glyphs, and so what I, what I will answer it in this uh, regard. The translation appears to be very much along the lines of what we might find uh, on a uh, marine poster, on a uh, Navy uh, ship somewhere, essentially without revealing the exact information, because I want to reserve that for Los Angeles next week in my last appearance there. Uh, essentially, it says that the beings of this ship are... Uh, are are ready, they're aware, and then it identifies them, in fact, as a female warrior. And that's about wow. as close as I can get. Um, Gee, with your opening comments, I would have translated that to mean the star people want you. Kind of like, <laughs> kind of like the old Uncle Sam with his finger pointing at you to recruit. Right. Well, um, uh, my apologies. The translation, the decipherment that we came up with after uh, the study of the linguistics breakdown, in fact, is more of a uh, semper fidelis, you know, uh, Marines ready and uh, uh, prepared, that kind of uh, situation. Oh, isn't that something? This is the end of side one. Please leave the... Let's go to the phones. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morningsky. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? All right, where are you, sir? My name's Kirk. I'm calling from Santa Ana. Santa Ana, all right. Yeah, I have a question. With all the billions of comets floating out there in the Oort cloud, at least that's what astronomers say, is that there's this big cloud of comets floating out there that periodically get nudged out and they drift into the solar system. What makes you guys think that this particular pair of comets that was recently discovered, as you say, is this Kachina. Oh, all right. First of all, we have only discovered, to the best of my knowledge, one comet, and that is hale uh -huh. um, uh, But the question is a fair one. With respect to that comet, why that one? Well, 
I am reliant upon the the data and the information that is given to me by others, other researchers. Again, I want to stress, I, I am not a physicist, an astronomer. I, I am basically uh, no one. I am an average man. Um, I, I'm a dancer uh, by profession. I am simply addressing the Hopi prophecies and some uh, ancient uh, cultures and simply saying that should the data that is being provided be accurate, then in fact it does fulfill Hopi prophecy and, and many of the stories of ancient societies. So uh, the listener, the person who just called in, my apologies uh, to Kirk, I think it was, that um, should the data be incorrect, then in fact the prophecies and what I have spoken about would not be correct. I sure. am dependent upon scientists and astronomers and the data that they uh, provide. Uh, good answer. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Where are you calling from, please? Ohio. Ohio. All right. Welcome to the program. Is it snowing in Ohio or has it stopped? Well, it's snowing. It's snowing. Yeah. All right. Get good and close to your phone and speak up good and loud for us, sir. Okay. Um, you, uh, I've been listening to you and I just want to uh, uh, explain something or, or warn you, maybe. Uh, you remember Lot was in Nineveh, in the city of Nineveh? And he, uh, the two angels went to visit him, and uh, he told them that they better get out of the city of Nineveh. Yes. And he went in and he shut the door. Lot went in the house. Yes. And he shut the door behind him. The angel shut the door. Yes, sir. And all the people were blinded. And what that's, that's a picture of it's... Uh, uh, they wanted to know Lot uh, in a spiritual adultery re relationship. They wanted to know Christ, and by doing it, they blinded the multitude. And which is happening today? The people in the world are becoming spiritually blinded from the truth. God has sent them a strong delusion that they believe a lie, and uh, it's sad. It really is because you think it's the truth, but you're really following a false gospel. All right, um, let me get your reaction to that, uh, Robert. That is. Of course, uh, a devout Christian. And uh, he is uh, politely scolding you and me and all of us for even talking of such matters. How do you generally respond to people who approach you that way? Um, with a great deal of respect, and again to uh, this gentleman, I, I did not hear his name, um, I absolutely respect his position and his words and uh, uh, what it is that he wishes to uh, believe, and I have no problem with that. I, I can only hope that... Uh, that I am accorded and that, and that you sir, are accorded the same privileges. Uh, the wonder of uh, this, particularly this country is that it should be tolerant of all beliefs. And so I, I cannot begin to portray uh, this gentleman's belief systems as inaccurate or wrong. It's interesting, Robert. Our nation, uh, constitutionally, absolutely uh, respects all of these different belief systems and allows for them and protects them, uh, as a matter of fact. But the individual religions don't, nor do they have to. And, uh, and so they, they are very narrow and very structured. And uh, if you are not within those particular uh, uh, bounds, uh, you're not going to be respected. And he did it politely. Yes, but absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I've got to say that there are elders on the reservation that have uh, uh, scolded me in a much more uh, colorful and dramatic uh, fashion. So uh -huh. I thank the gentleman for, uh, you know, the way that he put it. But, you know, again, as I said, I respect his position, and, and I hope that he allows us to uh, express our position. All right, good. Let's continue to do that then. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Hi, my name's Maureen, and I'm calling from Kirkland, Washington. Hi, Maureen. Hi, I wanted to know what's the best way that we can prepare for the coming changes. Any oh, idea? now that's an awfully good question. Uh, Robert, uh, uh, the best way to prepare for what's coming? Well, uh, let's not put Robert on the spot here for a moment. Um, let me, number one, mention that I will be in Seattle, Washington at the end of January. I'm holding uh. a, a two-day intensive workshop, and we're going to address precisely that. Um a very quick answer is simply this. In the workshops and in the materials that we are that I am presenting, I am trying to, to um let's see how can I explain it. Uh if if I were to ask this lady to describe a bear, she might very well suggest that the bear is a very gentle, compassionate beast of nature. If I asked Art Bell what is the bear, he'll say, Well, this is a nasty, evil carnivore that'll bite you in the butt the minute you turn around. And so the question I think is, what is the truth? 
Uh, we know our Bell's truth. It's a, a carnivore. We know this lady's truth. It is a gentle beast of nature. The truth is that somewhere in between? Is it a combination of the two? My suggestion in all of my, my uh, research and workshops and lectures and papers is that the truth is the bear. And I suggest that what we need to do is to sort through all the beliefs, set them aside, and address what we know, what we absolutely know. Uh, in the Terra Papers in the first uh, uh, book, what I am trying to suggest is that star beings those that are out there do not have a religion per se. They do not have a belief system. They have a system based on knowing. Uh, the stars are a certain way. The uh, planets are another way. Uh, the human physiology, the star being physiology, is a certain way. A belief system is unique to mankind. And uh, I do not want to take anyone's belief system away from them, but I can only suggest a very quick answer is to search for the bear. All right. Well, a very quick response would be, yeah, but if you're wrong, it'll bite you in the butt for sure. There are days it's going to bite you in the butt, and the next day it's going to lick you on the cheek. And, and that <laughs> is, <laughs> the, you know, the, the idea that a truth is universal and unchanging is one of the uh, things that is going to be very difficult to deal with. Truths change. The bear changes daily. Yes, sir. Um, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Hi, uh, this is Jim from Oregon City. Hello, Jim. Listening to you on uh, Como 1000 tonight. Uh, well, I bet it's piling in there. Yeah. Good. Anyway, I'd uh, like to say hello to Robert Morningstar. Morning, Sky. Sky, right. He's right here. Good evening, sir. Uh, how are you, sir? Good, sir. How are uh, you? Oh, fine. I've made several trips down there to uh, the uh, 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 to your area and uh, have met uh, several people down there. And uh, they're all talking about the same things that uh, you speak about. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was a question I wanted to ask you. How uh, are, are how is everybody holding up uh, after that freeze that uh, you experienced back in June? The freeze that we experienced. Yeah, that's when the crops froze. Oh, <laughs> um, on a personal level, I was very fortunate. I was on the road. I, I was not here. However, um, we deal with the uh, cards that we are given. Um, we will survive. It is one of those uh, maxims that I think all primitives, uh, are the, the savage peoples of this world, I love the word savage, uh, we adhere to is that regardless of the freeze, the heat, the uh, drought, or the famine, that uh, we will endure because we are not dependent on the light switch on the wall. Uh, no, but we are dependent on Mother Earth. Absolutely. And I know that uh, Native American peoples believe that Mother Earth is, in fact, a living organism. Is that is that going too far? Is that about right? Oh, no. That, that is, again, part of the, the very basic existence uh, daily. Uh, Mother Earth is a living thing. It, uh, she, she is teeming with life. She does take a breath. She grows. Uh, there are parts that uh, are regenerated, uh, and I would suggest, along with other Native Americans who have gone out and said, Mother Earth is in pain. She is crying. She is hurting. And that's what I was going to ask you. If you were to describe Mother Earth's present uh, attitude, well, you just did. Yeah. She, she, you would say she is in pain. Oh, she's in, in great pain. She is shivering. She is shaking, and um, it, I hope, as... as part of the answer to the lady just a moment ago, that we need to uh, take care of, of uh, Mother Earth because, in fact, we are dependent on her. The light switch is not anywhere near as crucial as uh, the fresh air and the uh, water. Mm -hmm. We have a legend from long ago that says that the uh, Great Spirit converted the most beautiful woman in the universe, and he changed her into Mother Earth. She, uh, Her hair became the grass, her blood became the rivers, her bones became the very stones themselves, and we are all descended and born of Mother Earth, and we need to take care of her as we take care of our own mothers, our own grandmothers, our daughters, and our wives. And it's absolutely vital. One of the answers to the uh, previous question was we have to be aware that Mother Earth is in pain. Robert, I don't know where I got it. It just came from inside. But you said something a little while ago that stood the hair up on the back of my neck. You said we're on a downhill slide. I have said, uh, when I refer to the quickening, that we have passed the point of no return. 
And to me, that personally does not mean that the world is going to end. I keep saying it so people understand it. But it means to me that we are going to go on to whatever is next, and there is going to be a change, and that it seems to me, or at least I guess I've concluded, that it is unavoidable. And I absolutely agree. I think one of the things that, uh, in my very, very brief uh, encounters with you, sir, is, impresses me is that many times when you speak, the few times that I have heard you've been able to listen to you when I uh, was on the road, I, I think many of the uh, comments that you make come from deep within. I think uh, many of your listeners, I, I think the reason that they're listening is because it strikes the chord deep within. The answers are there. So we just need to recognize them. And, but I absolutely agree with you. There is the end of the world as we know it, meaning the systems, the institutions, and, and the ways in which we punish ourselves. Those will change. But it is not, not the end of the world at all. On the other hand, I'm sure a banker on Wall Street would think it is the end of the world. <laughs> uh, you and I, I'm sure, well, will go out and powwow and we'll dance uh, all through the night. There are, campfire. That's right. There are many worlds. And thank you for the kind words. Uh, perhaps it would be summed up... Um, um, as I summed it up once, when we did a what if, which of course everybody dragged out and uh, changed as if to say that I said some comet was coming to hit Earth, I didn't say that. What I did say was that w if a comet should be coming uh, to hit Earth, I think that uh, after, you know, considering it carefully, I would um, sit right here as long as I could and talk to you, probably get a good observation post. And we'd all watch it come in together. That's a sort of a dance, I guess. You're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Where are you calling from, please? Hi, this is Mark uh, from Honolulu. Hi, Mark. Hi, Art and uh, Robert. Hi to you. Welcome, you, sir. It's good to talk to you again because I first met you several years ago when you did uh, the tour in Melbourne, Australia with uh, my friend Duncan Rhodes. Oh, yeah, sure. Duncan is a good man. Yeah, he is. And uh, I was just wondering, though, that if any of in your historical... Um, the background, you know, with the the Hopi or the Apache Indians, is there any uh, indication like with this change, like what will come on is like a uh, a moving into another dimensional area where let's just say that the the world and the people as it is now are just in a lighter space while the third dimensional realm that we understand now stays here so people can keep working out their heaviness? All right, well, that's a long question uh, and not much time to answer. Uh, let me try very briefly and, and dangerously oversimplify. Uh, essentially, in the Southwest, the belief is that uh, death is a transition that... Uh, the end of this uh, cycle is again transition. I don't want to equate that with death, but that whatever it is that we are doing now, if you're a drummer, a da uh, dancer, a singer, an artist, a farmer, Got a break. that that's what's going to happen in the next cycle. All right. Well said. We'll be right back.
Kingdom of Nod. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's our best. Once again, here I am, Robert Morning Sky, Native American, native to the Hopi and Apache Indian nations. Back with us in a moment, a quick number fest for you. Uh, if you would like to order a copy of my book while they are still available, um, the number to call to order The Art of Talk is 1-800-864-7991. 1-800-864-7991. We will be giving each of you who uh, register for our big trip coming up uh, to Russia and to Scandinavia a 12-day excursion on Holland America's pride and joy. Uh, great big ship, beautiful vacation, coming August 3rd. Call and get the brochure. I don't have time to tell you any more about uh, all of it, but uh, call and get the brochure. If you're in the Eastern Time Zones, you call 1-800-848-7120. That's 1-800-848-7120. They'll send you a whole brochure on this. Central Mountain Times, call 1-800-633-2732. And Pacific Time Zones, call 1-800-624-7720. 7, 9. All of them at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time. That's uh, once again in the Pacific time zone, 1 800 6247779. And the brochure is absolutely free. I'll show you what, where we're going. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. Another important number is if you would like to order a copy of this program or our newsletter. Please make note of this number. Good 24 hours a day. The number is 1-800-917-4278. That's 1-800-917-4278. All right, that was the number fest. Uh, now let me give my guests an opportunity quickly to plug. What would you like to plug? If you could plug something, you've got the Terra Papers... Uh, what would you like to plug, Robert? Well, thank you very much, sir, um, for the opportunity. One, let me uh, uh, plug Art Bell and say that uh, I'm very <laughs> pleased to say that uh, there are a few warriors on the uh, quest for the truth, and I'm very, uh, very happy to, to be able to uh, know that Art Bell is going to continue with his quest. So I, I am honored. I'm very, very honored. <laughs> um, I, I will uh, for again the, the rest of uh, this uh, year for me until February 1st. I have uh, the Terra Papers, which is the uh, essentially the summation of the research on the history of uh, mankind, the hidden history of mankind. We are releasing uh, next week in Los Angeles the report on Hale Bop and the Santilli Glyphs, the decipherment. Um, people who would be interested in, in reaching us. Um, in my retirement phase, I, I hope to be able, should the interest be there, to take people on uh, vision quests and to take them uh, on expeditions into the uh, Canyonlands to show them some of the uh, data that we use to put out our books. They can reach me at, uh, I have a phone number, area code 602-996-6324, and our fax number is area code 602-953-0129. And I invite uh, those people who live uh, in Los Angeles. My last appearance will uh, in Los Angeles area is next weekend. In Seattle, I'll be there the last weekend in January. And then my very, very final appearance, I intend to powwow and dance uh, madly, will be in Austin, Texas, the uh, second weekend of uh, February. And uh, Well, you are heard in all of the areas you just spoke of, so... Oh, well, good. Well, I, I invite everybody to come out and uh, dance with me, and uh, hopefully we make some sense uh, with the lectures and workshops, and uh, we will toast Art Bell when we do this. Robert, thank you. Um, you're more than kind. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Hi, Mr. Morningside. Good evening, sir. Where are you, sir? I'm from Flint, Michigan. All right. And uh, I have a couple questions. Um, one is, uh, do, do Native Americans really uh, think differently or uh, have different ideas about things like success? serenity and fear? 
Again, I hate to to speak for anyone other than myself, but I think if you look at uh, uh, friends, books, uh, material that is out there, it should be pretty evident that we do have a different perception of what success is. We don't measure it in terms of of money, but in fact of uh, moments of uh, happiness and uh, um, feeling proud. I know that People don't understand it when one of the things that we teach in the warrior way is is that we should be able to wake up every morning and say it is a good day to die. That does not in any way uh, manifest a death wish. What it says is that I have lived my life to its fullest. I have said I love you to those that I care about. I have done the best that I have could and and, uh, defended with honor the integrity of of being a warrior. And uh, so the perception of success... Um, I, I, I can confidently answer that yes, but again, I do not speak for anyone other than myself. Yeah, I understand. Um, the, the other one is, um, well, I have some friends that, like, they were white until fairly recently, and they've become <laughs> like sorry. overnight Indians. I'm sorry? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, too. You want to run that one by us again? <laughs> well, they, they've, uh, they, they started going to sweat lodges, making handcrafts, and reading Native American philosophy. And I was just curious what your opinion is. That uh, oh, I see. All right. He, what he's saying is they're going Native. Um, again, as I said earlier, you know, to be a warrior means that you have a type of heart. To be a Native American means you have a type of blood. Um, contrary to what some elders have argued with me about, I do believe that there are warriors who are out there who have the genetic makeup of what we consider to be a white man, a black man, and an Oriental man. So uh, they're going Native. Um, fantastic. I, I, I will admit to a prejudice. I hope they powwow and dance and wear a feather or two. <laughs> All right. Uh, from Jody in Hawaii a fax. Art and Mr. Morning Sky, I've heard of, quote, bringers of the light, end quote, and other such extraterrestrials who were seeded here on Earth. You stated that we are the descendants of the star people. The reason we can't see them is because they look like us. I'd like to take it one step further. Is it possible we cannot see them because we are them? Oh, I would absolutely agree. I think that on an unconscious level in this reality, there are many of us um, who are bringers of the light. I think that uh, much like the underground in uh, Europe who is waiting for the uh, signals on the BBC, you know, from the Allies, I think that there are some uh, beings here who will recognize the signals, for example, be they hail bop uh, the alien autopsy film, a crop circle. Um, I believe that the signals are being sent and that some will awaken and that, in fact, the premise that uh, this lady is suggesting is, is I, I would absolutely agree with and support. Let me ask you about crop circles. Uh, crop circles have many of the same attributes, it seems to me, as some glyphs seem to have. Uh, indecipherable. Uh, have you looked carefully at um, some of the uh, the better photography of crop circles? And if so, do you make anything of it? Well, absolutely. I, you know, uh, Art Bell continues to uh, amaze me because he has anticipated uh, one of the uh, few people that uh, I have met in uh, my travels this year and actually over the last couple of is one Busty Taylor, who is a photographer who worked with Colin Andrews. I met Colin Andrews years ago in Australia. Oh, yes. And um, I know this is going to sound odd, but at the end of January, my appearance in Seattle, I have invited Busty Taylor, who will be flying in from England. We will be presenting a two-day workshop, and we're going to compare the petroglyphs with crop circles, and we will compare them to the Santilli hieroglyphs uh, on that alien autopsy tape. So, Art, you've done it again. You've anticipated (laughs) precisely what we want to do at the end of the month in in Seattle. So, should anyone be interested in a, a comparison of petroglyphs, crop circles, and the Santilli hieroglyphs, uh, if they can at all uh, uh, do it, uh, we will be there in Seattle at the end of uh, January doing just that. Very good. East of the Rockies, your turn with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. This is Randy calling from Arkansas. How you doing, Randy? Oh, okay, fine. I love your show, by the way, Art. Thank you. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Morning Star. Uh, Sky. Morning Sky. Morning Sky. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have two questions. Do you believe in angels and also... Uh, I believe you spoke of changing into something coming up here in the next few years. Do you believe that this may be a change into a different spiritual body? Okay. Um, In response to the uh, first question, uh, I do believe in angels, but I don't believe uh, in 
the the concept that is generally portrayed now as a, a glowing being with a halo and wings. I believe that there is a basis for this figure. Uh, again, in the Terra papers that we we wrote, we present an explanation of what the angels really are. So my answer, yes, I do, but not in the commonly accepted. Uh, can you give me, Can you give me the short version of what Robert Morning? Uh Sky believes an angel is what is an angel? Um, whew, very good question. There were essentially uh, figures who assisted the star beings who colonized the solar system and planet Earth. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin refers to them as the Nephilim, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Anunnaki. Uh, the term angel is actually derived from two root words, Enki and El. Enki is uh, Princea. He is the, essentially the star being who created mankind, and El simply means the Lord. Uh, the Enki Elves or the angels were those who assisted mankind, who uh, helped in the development and education and becoming uh, more human. And so, yes, I do believe in them, but not quite in the uh, fashion that is being portrayed. They are absolutely accurate, and I believe they exist today. I think there are star beings who continue to motivate and assist mankind in achieving a different spirituality, a different level of consciousness. All right. Uh, and by the way, for everybody out there, I have the most remarkable, remarkable photograph of what is clearly an angel um, that you've ever seen in your whole life. And I want to make something very clear because I have received a couple of messages uh, to the contrary. Um, I, we have a, I shouldn't say I, there is a fellow across town, retired FBI fellow, who has put up a bulletin board and is kindly carrying for us the files uh, and photographs that we collect that are unusual that I would like to be able to share with all of you. There is no charge to go on that bulletin board one time each day and download a photograph. I urge you, if you have a computer, to go and download uh, a photograph called angel.gif. That's angel.gif. And you can do it at the bulletin board, and as I'll repeat this one more time, so I hope it's clear to all. You absolutely can go on there, member or not, free of charge, one time per day. If you want to upgrade your status from there, it's fine. Uh, it'll cost you some bucks, a uh, few bucks, not very many. But one time per day, it is free. F-R-E-E, -E, free. The number to call to get into the bulletin board is area code 702 Seven two seven one seven zero nine seven zero two area code seven two seven one seven zero nine and we're going to be talking more about that photograph. So if you can lay your hands on it, by all means, do so. And our phone lines west of the Rockies. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Hi, Robert. Art and yes. Robert. Sorry. Yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is Todd in Bellevue, Washington. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a Christian also, so um, I wanted to be respectful and uh, say that I appreciate that you believe what you believe. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, the Bible does teach that um, there will come a time that there will be, for better lack of term, um, a one-world religion where everybody will become more spiritual but no apparent specific religion. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be where we're coming to, and that's why so many Christians believe this is the end time. And I wanted to ask if he believes that there's a possibility that he has been deceived because there are so many people that believe different things. Someone does have the truth, and obviously Christians believe they have the truth. Robert, you believe you have the truth. Is there a possibility you have been deceived? All right, it is a wonderful and politely put question, and also a good one. Uh, Robert, I'm sure you've thought about it deeply. Uh, Absolutely, and um, I'm sure that... Um, the gentleman realizes that if I could, if I did not uh, acknowledge the possibility that certainly I would be very, very foolish. Yes, it is possible, sir, that that I have been deceived. As it is possible that you have and Art has, it is possible we all have. I believe that uh, what we need to do is to really, down in our guts, we have the answer deep within. And uh, I, I would actually probably agree with your opening statement that where we are going does probably lend itself itself to uh, the concept of a one-world union, I just hesitate to use the term religion. A one-world union? A common spirituality. Well, <laughs> what about a common governing body? 
I have a problem with the word governing, I would prefer to use the word sharing, where you and I share, uh, where Todd shares an equal responsibility in deciding the direction of, uh, of the masses, I, I guess. That's are there uh, are there too many of us on Earth? Too many of us? Yes. I have been to powwows where there are, are uh, a thousand dancers on a football field, and that's probably the only time that I could say that there are too many of us just <laughs> because I'm self en selfish enough to want ah. to dance. <laughs> um, are there too many of us on planet Earth? Yes. Um, no, no, I, I don't think that there are too many of us. Um, whatever numbers are appropriate for the time is what is occurring. Fascinating. All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Art. Hi. Where, I'm calling where? from Carson City. My name's Marty. Okay, Marty. K-O-H. Glad to have you. Hi. I'd like to ask Robert a question in regards to the... Um, uh, does he believe that there were other... other um, other beings living on other planets, all the other planets like uh, the moon, Uranus, Pluto, so on and so forth. Uh, Close-in planets, um, all right. Uh, Robert? Um, yes, our research and uh, the materials that we have collected uh, essentially support the idea that there was life on other planets. The two most obvious candidates, and, and I believe that time will show that there is uh, or was life on these planets, are those that we call Venus and Mars, certainly the uh, face on Mars has to, to be a, a very, very strong argument for the existence of some sort of civilization on that planet. I take it you have followed Richard Hoagland's work closely. I have only just recently been introduced to it, and I'm going to suggest that the same kind of phenomena will be uh, witnessed on Venus. All right. Oh, my. Uh, well, that is an interesting prediction. Robert Morning Sky is my guest. And there's more if you'll stay right there. KVEG 840 Radio in Las Vegas is now carrying Dreamland live. And uh, just to show you, uh, they didn't tell us they were going to do it, but I notice these things. So KVEG 840, thank you. Now, uh, we're about to go back to Robert Morning Sky, uh, but I think he will enjoy the following facts. I know I did. It is from a man named Michael, and um, I can't, uh, I guess up in Oregon. He says, Dear Art, your guest and discussion tonight are very interesting as usual. What you said about how we'd react if we no longer had electricity reminded me of a pretty good story. It goes like this. A young bride was showing off her new home to her dear old grandmother. Of course, this included her very modern kitchen that was filled with electronic appliances and gadgets galore. After the full tour was complete, Grandma asks the young lady, If you had to give up all your modern appliances and conveniences except one, which one would it be? So the granddaughter thought for some time, finally replied, well, I guess the one thing I just couldn't do without would have to be my refrigerator. The grandmother smiled and said, honey, I'd pick running water any time. And I thought you might enjoy that, Robert. That's fantastic. Great story. Great story. <laughs> <laughs> This is the end of... Oh, we've got a zillion people out there who would like to uh, speak to you, so I guess it's onward and upward. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Art, Robert, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good Where evening, are you? Sir. This is the Magic Christian calling from San Buenaventura, California. All right. Good trip, California. Mm. Yes, uh, Mr. Morning Sky, I'd like to know if in the Hopi traditions or prophecies there is anything that would correspond to uh, a prophecy made several places in the Christian New Testament about what we have come to, come to know as the rapture, the sudden disappearance of a great deal of people, human bodies off the face of the earth all, uh, all right. in one instant. It is an interesting question. Is there any corresponding uh, legend uh, at all? No, I am not familiar with anything that is uh, remotely close to that phenomenon. That does not mean it's, it's not there. Again, I, I don't want to speak for the elders or, or any Hopi individual, but I am not familiar with anything uh, that is even close to that. 
Um, good enough. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Hello, Mr. Bell, Mr. Morning Sky. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Morning Sky, you were talking about uh, a brother or something that's supposed to be seven years after the common Hale Bob or uh, a relationship. Well, in other words, Hale Bob will portend uh, the arrival of another. Where are you calling from, sir? Uh, Utica, New York. Utica, New York. All right. And uh, your question is about, I presume, the other. Right. Um, the other, I think, um, Robert, uh, is roughly what Zachariah Sitchin refers to as the 12th planet. Uh, I am suggesting that, again, if the data is accurate, that this figure, this hale Bach comet that is going to be appearing in 97, is very likely uh, the 12th planet Nibiru. The Hopi prophecies that I am speaking of are about uh, a figure called Bahana, uh, the great white brother, which I think is a, a very loose translation. Um, but I am suggesting that there will be a brother to uh, hale Bop, which will probably appear roughly seven years after... Uh, would, it, would it be a comet? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, if hale Bop is a comet, then the brother is a comet, yes, sir. Right. And it would be larger? Or? I believe it will be larger, yes, sir. Well, there was a comet in 1811, and it was supposed to be recorded to be about a, a million miles in diameter. Have you heard anything about that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant of that, sir. Well, that, that, that would be... I don't see how anybody could call that... Well, I guess it could be a comet. I suppose if something was in a rogue returning orbit, it, right. would, it would be called a comet no matter its size, but a million miles, oh my. Uh, West of First time callers call area 702-727-1222. Hold it, hold it. Oh, okay. We are not allowed to put last names on the air. It is but one rule that we must follow. So let's just have you give your first name only. Okay. And tell us where you are. Oh, my name is uh, Gregory. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma. All right. Yeah, and uh, hi, Art. Hi. I, was, I wanted to ask uh, Robert, you know, th this is going to sound really off the wall, but he, I think that you all mentioned uh, Young's Collective Unconscious, and I heard that the, about this alien eye beam from the Warrior Woman. The glyphs, yes. Well, you know, what's really strange about that is that uh, Young believed that UFOs were manifested from man's belief in them. And it's almost as if uh, the eye beam would be like uh, the structure of the female creative creativeness of the universe, and the warrior woman would be the, would be the uh, collective unconscious. What, what does Robert think of that? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand, understand the, uh, the, the thrust of what you are saying. I can only suggest again that the decipherment that we are offering uh, to the uh, research community, um, I, I do not know actually what its contents are. I am suggesting a translation which is much more innocuous. It's much more simple. It simply was addressing uh, what a warrior woman might say. I am ready. I am prepared. That kind of thing. You may very well be correct. The problem that I have is that the uh, videos and the slides I have seen do not show a complete beam. It does not give us the context. It only gives us a couple of small pieces. Well, it would be sort of like uh, like the bone or like the noggle, I guess what, what shamanism would say would be a part right. of the noggle. Uh, it's, it's an interesting premise. I, I, I can see where we might be able to argue that. I just personally don't have enough of the beam hieroglyphs to, to really be convinced of that, though I, I think it's a, certainly a plausible idea that you've presented. Okay, well, right. thanks a lot. Right, thank you very much for the call, sir. And on our first-time caller line, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hi, Art. This is Mike in Montana. I've texted you several times in the past. I'm sorry, Mike. Where are you? I'm Mike in Montana. Montana, all right. Right, I've texted you several times in the past. Yes, sir. Uh, Robert, I have a question concerning Panaha. And in the past, we had heard that Panaha was, in fact, a Tibetan people. I'm not attached to any viewpoint, but I'd like to know what you have to say about that. I have had uh, several people indicate that they believed it was either the uh, Tibetan people, the Aborigines, or uh, possibly even the Dogon in Africa. I've also been exposed to uh, at least one gentleman who uh, claims that the Hopi have uh, declared him as Bahana. Um, uh, again, I, I simply don't believe that we are talking about a physical being. I think that we are talking about uh, the phenomena... Hale Bop, its brother. Um, 
certainly the possibility is that the translation speaks of a physical being, but I, the, the actual ancient Hopi, I do not believe says that. All right. Uh, so little time, so much to do. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, earlier you guys were both talking about Mother Earth, and uh, I just have to say that it's my feeling, actually my opinion, that there is no Mother Earth, that there is just a planet, which is a thing, and uh, it is more or less a creation, but it should never be worshipped, because we should worship the Creator, God, not the creation or the creation process. All right, let us find out if that is, in fact, uh, what is worshipped. Uh, Robert, is, is the Earth itself worshipped by uh, the Hopi, uh, by the Apache? Uh, I am not familiar with any Native American peoples. I'm not familiar with any peoples, um, be the Aborigines, Zulu, Maori. I'm not familiar with any of that worship the uh, Mother Earth. What we are saying is that we need to be respectful because we are part of its existence. I, I do not believe that it is just a thing. Um, it is as real and alive to me as any human being. One of the problems I have, and again I speak for myself, is the arrogance of a civilized world that chooses uh, what is alive and what is not. Um, I, I just have a real problem with that. But in direct response to the question, no, uh, we do not worship Mother Earth. We hold her in high regard. We hold her in as high regard as we do our brothers, our sisters, and our parents. Well, that's an awfully good answer, and I'm glad the question came up, and maybe it will prevent it from coming up, up, up uh, again, but I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't depend on it, Robert. Uh, they're trying to catch you, and they're Christians, and it's all right. It's just, I, I guess in a lot of ways, I tire of it. I, I knew that you did not worship the earth, uh, and thinking of the earth as a living thing is not the same as worshiping it as you would an idol, which is what he was suggesting uh, in, in sort of a slightly flippant way that you are idolizing a mere thing. Right. Uh, well, I, w I would simply attribute his position to a place of ignorance. That is not a, a, a criticism or, or denigrates the gentleman in any way. It, it just comes from not knowing, but uh, worship is, is not anywhere, uh, not remotely close to not how the right we word. would believe in Earth. Not the right word. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Hello, Art. This is Dave from Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, glad to have you. Get good and close to your phone, sir. You're a little hard to hear. Okay. I was wondering, uh, that was a good lead-in from the other caller, does the French nuclear testing and all the other nuclear testing that we've done in the past, does that uh, affect the Earth in a negative manner? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I'm, uh, I'm glad you asked it, uh, because I would not have. Robert, um, we are exploding bombs. We did it. The Russians have done it. The Chinese have done it. The French have done it. For all I know, the South Africans have done it right now. The French are doing it in the Pacific. Right, and I, I believe, I, I don't think anyone would have a problem understanding that we are changing the balance of Mother Earth, the natural uh, uh, growth and development. Um, we are destroying the bones and the essence of what goes on inside. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the Hopi and the Aborigine uh, in general accept is that as we treat our Mother Earth, so shall our, um, our, our mothers, our wives, and our daughters, so shall they manifest. In other words, I believe that Mother Earth is suffering internally. I am going to suggest that the women of our planet, our daughters, our wives, our mothers, uh, are also going to suffer internally. Women are going to start having reproductive problems because Mother Earth is having problems reproducing herself. Those problems which we begin to see in Mother Earth, the breakdown of the inner core, or the breakdown of the air and, and the very blood, the, the, the waters of, of Mother Earth, those breakdowns are going to be manifested in our women, and we're going to see more and more women having not only internal problems, but blood problems, reproduction problems, and bone problems. Boy, does that make sense. I suppose old Indians don't die, they just dance away. <laughs> Quite well said, yes, sir, and I intend to dance. Uh, perhaps uh, if, if you can call on your guardian angels and... Uh, uh, they might be able to entice us to come back, but I thank you very, very much for the uh, opportunity to speak to you. Robert Morning Sky is my guest. He is retiring. He is leaving public life. It is a sad thing because I would like to interview him again, though you never know what life holds. Would it be possible for me to uh, mention the L.A. conference? I just received a fax from the uh, producer, and, and they're almost sold out. I'm, I'm 
I'm very fortunate. Yes, you may mention it. Go ahead. Um, they're in, in Los Angeles next weekend. We will be putting on a two-day intensive. Um, I don't want to spend time other than to give the phone number, if I might. Go ahead. Uh, it's area code 818-355-9339. And then our final appearance with uh, a very honored, uh, I'm very honored to have both Busty Taylor and uh, Dr. Arthur Horn with me in Seattle. If people would like to catch that one, and that will be our last uh, intensive workshop, will be area code uh, 206 Seven six three three zero one eight, and thank you so much to you, uh, to your listeners and to you, sir, for allowing me to uh, be uh, with you and to uh, express the ramblings and ravings of a renegade. Of <laughs> a renegade. Well, let's let's get just a couple of more calls. We've got that much time. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Where are you, please? Uh, this is Curtis from Lexington, Kentucky. Hi, Curtis. Uh, Mr. Morning Sky, are you familiar with a uh, Mr. Jose Arguelles? I only know the name, sir. I do not know the work. Oh, okay. Well, I was just wondering if uh, you knew how Art could get in touch with him and if he gives uh, interviews of any sort. But I think that would be a good uh, good person to get in touch with. Well, sir, if you can help me out. Um, uh, uh, he worked, He has uh, some books with uh, Barron Company. I think that's the latest publishing company. That might be enough. I'll give it a try. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Howdy, Robert. This is Dennis. Good evening, sir. Dennis and Medford. Uh, I had a quick question for you on uh, uh, basically arts, the quickening. Uh, is there any in the Hopi uh, histories uh, of the Earth and its poles changing axis? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, there is a story. Um, one of the legends speaks of uh, Spider Woman, who has placed two twin grandsons, one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, in the Northlands and in the Southlands. And the legends, and there are numerous uh, uh, legends, do speak of the changing of positions of the two twins uh, several times. And I'm going to suggest that these legends that say the twins change places, in fact, uh, verifies and confirms the concept of a pole shift. Uh, I was just speaking myself. I know from uh, from the Comanche legends that the, uh, the sun at one time did come up in the west and sat in the east. So That's correct. Yeah. And I... I there are several there nations that do address, I think, that very, very same concept that there has been a changing of the North and South Poles, that the directions were reversed at some point. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, caller. First time caller line. Running out of time. You're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hi. Oh, um, listen. I wanted to know a little bit more about the Blue Star Kachina. Um, Hail Bob. How does that relate? Well, uh, we've covered that extensively. It is the view of Robert Morning Sky that... Uh, uh, Hillbop may well be the Blue Kachina, or Blue Star. Right, Robert? That's correct, sir. Absolutely. All right. Wild card line? Uh, nope. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Hello. Yes. Uh, congratulations, Art, for getting Robert Morning Sky on. Thank you. Where are you? At, uh, calling from St. Louis. Listen to KSD. Oh, and yes. Uh, could you get Carlos uh, Castaneda on, please? Well, we could try. Uh, do you have any question for my cur- present guest? Uh, no, just tell him to keep up the good work. All right. All right, all right, all right thank the you. The blind man and the elephant uh, parable applies very much to what he's talking about. The blind man and the, and the elephant. elephant where everyone's parable. reaching for, they've got the whole elephant and they've got a hold of God. That's what the, all the religions of mankind are all about and about the Indians. They're all in, going in the right direction. Well, that may well be. That may well be. And it, uh, I'm sure it may be, uh, Robert. Would you agree or disagree? There may be many paths to the same destination. Oh, absolutely. Very, very much so. I mean, um, there's the highlands and the lowlands. Absolutely, sir, without a doubt. All right. Uh, let's see. Can we squeeze? East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Robert Morning Sky. Where are you? Edmonton. Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. All right. Uh, one quick question, then we got to go. Okay. Uh, just uh, to, to ask him if he has a word of wisdom for uh, those of us on the path to higher spirituality. Very simply, three words, pursue your passion. Whatever that is that is fire within you, pursue that, and the rest of it actually will all fall into place. It's like saying follow your gut, follow your instincts. Pursue your passion, yes, sir. Gosh, which so many have said. Robert, uh, it has been a pleasure, and in your public retirement as it comes, I wish you well. 
thank you very much, or thank you to your listeners and to you, and uh, you've been very generous. Thank you, my friend. Take care, guy. Good night. That's Robert Morning Sky. And uh, if you'd like a copy of this program to archive, I can imagine you would. You can get it by calling 1 800 917 4278. Right now, 24 hours a day. That's 1 800 917 4278. From an area near Dreamland, this is Dreamland. Good night. This has been Dreamland a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.